Well, happy to get the breakdown here on NFTs. Uh, you know, we've been talking about it for a while here. Um, you know, if we if we focus in on Jack Dorsey, right? Um, he's minting the first tweet on the Ethereum run service sent. And the first thing I want to understand is, is this uh, bullish for Ethereum, especially Vince? Um, it's, it's bullish for Ethereum and, and crypto that's like Ethereum. Uh, and by that, I mean, Bitcoin uh, is, is absolutely uh, defined by its scarcity uh, and other things. But Ethereum, uh, you can print more of them. So, uh, so that's uh, something that has been holding Ethereum back. But this application of, of Ether and, and potentially other coins like that uh, as a network that's more important than the scarcity, uh, it, it's, it definitely makes uh, the Ether type of products uh, much more valuable. Yes. If we take a step back though, let's take it a step back. Um, how did this concept of NFTs come about? How long has it been around for? And did Jack Dorsey just make it cool? Yeah, uh, I don't I don't know when the NFT concept started, but I, I, people started talking about tokens and ICOs in 2017 when we talked about this before, uh, but I wasn't up on that yet. The concept has been around for a while and it's been one of the bleeding edges of the crypto world in the sense that uh, if properly used, uh, tokens are like serial numbers, they're like verification, they're another extension of the trustless transaction. You know, we do something with a token attached to it, with the token itself, and we know that there's, it's one of a kind. It's like a signature in that respect. Uh, but, you know, with values now being placed on tweets, and, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people will say, you know, it just seems ridiculous to me, or with now values being placed on, you know, moments happening in sporting events. I mean, what's next, Vince? Where, uh, you know, is it like uh, endless possibilities here? Yeah, it, it, it is. It, all right. It, the trader in me says, yeah, it's it's a bubble. It's insane. Uh, but the but the secular trend person in me says this is not going anywhere. So, you know, there are, uh, like for example, uh, as a trader, if if Jack Dorsey's tweet is worth two point five million dollars, right. what's his second tweet worth? OK, but on that note, right, two point five million dollars for his first tweet. But, you know, Please educate me on this, okay? okay? What are you supposed to do with that tweet? I oh, mean, how oh. does it become a store of value or wealth preservation or an investment? Okay, I'm still drilling down on that, but but it's kind of like uh, a tweet or 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 a, any digital art. Let's call that a piece of digital art in that respect. It's digital content. Uh, if if you purchase a piece of art from someone uh, and it's verified as one of a kind then it's yours. And I guess you can make copies of it and sell kind of like lithographs on a painting. Right. What I'm not sure about, and I think it has to do with who's selling. So uh, uh, for example, if, if uh, Jack sells his tweet for $2.5 million, I believe, and this is from going on the website and looking at what it means uh, afterwards, I believe you can negotiate whether it's uh, one of a kind, meaning I won't uh, use it anymore. I won't make other copies of it. Or if it's going to be uh, something that uh, I'm giving you one of, it's an original, it's the first, but it's one of many. Kind of like a, a, a Hummel to simplify it. But uh, but I, I think to speak directly to the point is, is, is that you are, you know, you made a comment about buying a moment. Yeah, you're buying a moment. The art is the moment. The art is, that's the first tweet. You know, like you mentioned Gronkowski, you know, the moment the art is him catching the pass. The 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 uh, signed picture is is the is the memorabilia. But now you can do it digitally with less intermediaries, less people getting in the way, less bureaucratic cost, and the artist can be paid uh, better for their work. And, and less chances of fraud or fakes, right? You don't right, have for to, now. Yeah, right. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows what the future is going to hold? But I agree with you. I mean, that's that's true. Um, all this talk about NFTs, uh, you know, kind of resonated with me when I was listening to a talk that Mark Burstow, Barrick's uh, CEO, was giving during uh, the PDAC, the world's largest mining uh, conference taking place uh, virtually, obviously, this year from Toronto. Um, but listen to this quote, okay? Uh, he said, there is an over-exuberance in the financial markets right now with investors piling into assets that don't have any real value. So, do you see this as an example? Like, do you, could you see NFTs falling into this? Because 
you know, what is the real value? I, I, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, I can look at it both ways and, and I wanna look at it his way first. Uh, to say that there's an over exuberance is true. To say that these assets don't have any real value is true. But but to say, and and when you hear someone say they don't have any real value, I want you to think of when Peter Schiff says, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. These are comments that I think are uh, not naive or they're not, I think these comments are naive to say something has no real value. Well, then why isn't it trading zero? So, so not to criticize uh, Mark Bristow, that's his business, but, but they don't have any real intrinsic value, but the value is with the buyer. The buyer determines the value. So, so to, to see the other side of that, you know, if Jack Dorsey's tweet is worth $2.5 million, $2 million, then his second tweet should be worth $2 million, right? But I don't see that out there. I see a lot of, right now, I see clout chasing, I see status seeking, but that's the way it always goes with, with new exciting tech. I mean, how different is this than the dot-com bubble uh, when people were squatting on URLs? Uh, there's not much difference. I think it's a website. It's like a website URL boom. Boom, I want to be involved in the tech. I want to be involved in it. It's like a FOMO on, on the next uh, generation. But guess what? You know, that stuff all ends up crapping out, uh, but the internet stays. So cryptos are probably here to stay, although NFTs are probably just, uh, NFTs on tweets is probably just, you know, uh, a hot topic. But I guess if someone's watching, just thinking, well, how do I get in on the NFT game? I mean, are you simply just, you could simply just buy one of these memorabilias? Okay, so you take, your child does a lovely picture of a cow. They draw it. You take a picture of the cow. You put the picture on a website. You have a token attached okay. to it. And you say that this is a picture of my daughter, the cow that my daughter drew. And that picture is, is uh, going to be one of, I'm not gonna make another one of those and my daughter is gonna be famous. She's great. She's gonna be Picasso, right? So I pay, for, I, I go to the site and I go, oh, there's, you know, there's, there's uh, your daughter's uh, uh, picture of a cow and I buy it and it's one of a kind and there won't be any more made. And I know it's verified because it's on there. But the re reality of it is, is that's how, that's how I participate on the buy side. On the sell side, you can do it right now. I went to the site and yeah. uh, I just put up my most popular tweet, okay? Uh, which, you know, I, don't, I you know, I don't have a lot of followers, but um, I put up a tweet that was just something, something that I said about uh, during the uh, Iraq-Iran war uh, and it had like, I don't know, 20,000 likes or, you know, something ridiculous for, for, for my following status. And uh, I listed it, it's for sale now. So if you have cryptos, you can bid on like the, someone will pay 50 cents for me for it. You know, I'll probably sell it. Who the hell knows? But, but that the, the concept is, is you can list your art, your digital art seamlessly. So if you create digital art, uh, uh, you get it out there. It's kind of like a stock that, that was privately held is worth 10. And then when it's publicly traded, it's worth 25 because people are aware of it. It raises awareness. Does that make sense? What's the current bid on your tweet? Oh, no, no, there's no bid. No one cares. No, <laughs> I'll, I'll put a bid after this interview. Okay. I'm going to support right. you, my friend. All right, thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, but it makes me think, I have someone trying to sell me a Bitcoin Barney. Maybe they need to be looking uh, at yeah. this as a way uh, of doing it. No, um, you know, we, we were talking about this offline. Isn't this, isn't this just crazy? It, it's like, you know... I, yeah, I think the bigger picture, and I think the positive thing is it's really getting the conversation going around, you know, why is something valuable? You know, why yeah. is this X amount? Why is that X amount? And beyond that, what is money, right? Yeah. So that's what I find fascinating uh, and I, interesting. I, I agree. I mean, you know, when, when we talk about, when we talk about gold and silver, you'll hear me frequently say that gold's money and silver's not, right. you know, right. uh, but it's like gold is money and silver is currency in terms of the network being worth more than the store value. On that note, I want to continue uh, with the Mark Bristow topic and gold now, uh, because during the same conversation uh, during the PDAC, he said we should expect another spike higher for gold, even though it seems we've been in bearish territory since August of 2020. Where does gold go from here, Vince? Well, to his comment, uh, and, and this might be a little controversial, but to his comment, I would say uh, he's probably right, uh, but he's biased that way. You know, has he ever played the short side in gold? 
he's bullish gold. That's his business to be bullish gold. Right. So now, now that I've said that, you know, because he knows more about the, the metal in the industry than I ever did. I'm just a tactical trader. I, I think, I think, uh, I mean, look, that's a great question. You know, there is a sentiment indicator and, you know, this is, we'll call this, the kids will call this alpha. All right? Here's a little bit of alpha. There is a sentiment indicator out there that one of my clients uses, and it's really good. It's been around for about 40 years. And I, I can't say what it is, but yesterday it hit its low of 10 years in gold. And last night, last night with gold, like near the lows, it hit its low of all time in gold. And uh, that was like Wednesday night, right? So this client who was short and profitable gold covered on that. So he bought something else for long exposure as well. Uh, so a spike to 1800 is not crazy. Whether that leads to new highs, I don't know. But uh, uh, whether, whether I think Mark is biased or not, because that's his industry, I do know this. Uh, there, are, there are some big players out there that have covered shorts as of, as of Wednesday and Thursday. Do you feel this environment is similar to post 08 Vince where the market wished everything, you know, would go back to normal, but didn't know the full damage yet. The liquidity that was provided between 09 and 11 was caught in the banks, but this time around, uh, you know, has it arrived in the market? Yeah, um, I, I, think, I, I think in terms of the problem that caused 08, this is an extension of that. But the solution, like you said, as in 08 was, we give money to the banks and we hope that the banks trickle that money down to, to it's Wall Street versus Main Street, right? right? This time you had stimulus checks going right out to Main Street. This time you have, you have uh, PPP. This time you have small businesses, uh, whether it's enough or not, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna debate, but you have money hitting Main Street. And so, and so the, the, uh, there's a, I think there's a huge difference between this and then. You know, back then it was, we'll give money to Wall Street and hope it trickles down to Main Street. Now you're like, we'll give money to Wall Street, but we need to give money more to Main Street too because we messed up last time. So the government's doing it right in that respect. But the outcome, to your point, is the outcome is inflation. Inflation in terms of real inflation uh, in, 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 uh, in consumables and supply chain goods. Uh, and and, and as, as we talked about before, the explosion of retail stock trading is a comment on uh, discretionary money that people have. People have more money to spend now. Yeah, this inflation deflation, inflation deflation debate, uh, another fascinating topic. You know, I have so many guests on different sides of this. So, Vince, you're saying we are headed for an inflationary environment oh. because, on the flip side, I've had guests saying, look how cheap music is, clothing is, movies, most of yeah. the technology oh. stuff is free. And of course, you know, the counter argument is, well, you know, groceries obviously have gone up, uh, housing. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. maybe not rental so much, especially if we're looking at cities like New York City, but, you know, right. we're, you know, where do you fall? Um, I can give you two sentences that gives you both sides of the story, I think, relatively clearly, because I obsess about this. First of all, when you're talking about, uh, uh, when people want to talk about the market being in, that we're in an inflationary environment, they look at things that are priced higher. And when they look at, and then you have the other side saying we're in a deflationary environment, they look at things that are priced lower. So, so the consensus is things that you need to buy are too much and things that you already have are too cheap. So, so that soundbite aside, this is where I come down on it. We are in, if you believe we're in a bubble, as I, as I do, or an asset bubble, and you believe that we have an inflationary environment that that money that's in the assets is gonna come out of that and go into things that we buy, you are right. But the moment, because this market is so addicted to easy money, the moment that you tighten rates or decrease the, the flow of money into this market, when that happens, the stock market craters. When the stock market craters, businesses which aren't doing much for uh, Main Street anyway, will do even less. And you will have a deflationary snapback. So it's really damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, and, and that's how I look at it. Um, good thoughts. Um, I, you know, I could keep going on forever with you on this. I, I know we were also talking about perhaps a return to some sort of huge recovery as we're on a road to recovery. How uh, you know how big or how small could it be, 1950s style or not? How, how do you see that? Oh, you know, that's 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 funny. I'm seeing that everywhere, right? 1950s. Uh, is is the metric that seems to be uh, thrown right. into the narrative, and and I think you know they're throwing 1950s out fine, but the the, the, the reason that it's it's relevant because it is relevant is because it's post World War II economy growth. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the pandemic, 
right. compare the pandemic as a post catastrophic situation growth, you could be, they could be spot on with that, which leads me to the punchline. If this is a 1950s growth that we're going to be going through, that's great. Uh, and then what comes after that? 1960s and 1970s inflation. Do hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel.